Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this gloomy, or not, presentation about the funeral speeches of Jason and Clite after the Battle of Sisychus. In general, these two funeral speeches are considered the climax of the tragic moment of this episode where guilt and fear govern the scene. But is it really so pessimistic or can we detect also positive elements? And what each interpretation would mean for the new Jupiter era? As you can see, I will argue for an in-between reading of the episode where we will detect both negative and positive elements. So, the research question, as formulated for now, is how Valerius construct uh, these two speeches? What sources did he use most likely to create this episode and how does he transform them? Lastly, how are we to interpret the meaning of these speeches for the new Jupiter era and the future of the Roman Empire? Without further ado, let's see also the structure of today's presentation. First, I will discuss key aspects of uh, Jason's speech, including how it is constructed and uh, what is its interrelation with Virgil. Then I will focus on Clita's speech, what purpose does it serve and how Valerius transforms elements from Iliad and Enaid. After we have seen the two speeches and their interrelation with Virgil and Homer, I will try to explore their relation with Lucan's De Bellum Cibile. In order to do that, I will look at a parallel case in De Bellum Cibile that will shed light, I hope, on our interpretation of the lamentation scene. Finally, re-examining the Sisychus episode in general, we will see where Valerius stands in regards to the Roman Empire's future. Does he see a pessimistic future? Is it a positive one? Is it uh, something in between? Before we begin, let me quickly remind you of the situation before the speeches. During the night, uh, in the darkness, the people of Sisychus and the Argonauts do not recognize each other and they fight a terrible battle. The Argonauts kill their former host only to learn the tragic mistake in the light of day. The next day's scene opens with a description of the overwhelming sorrow and soon the reader realizes that Valerius is referring to Sisychus people who are the first to recognize their relatives. Suddenly, this personal grief stops because Sisychus' body is found and therefore public lament begins. The focus moves finally to the Argonauts who are equally sad. They lament for Jason and for his impious acts. The word nephas is very important as you can see in the passage uh, number one and they sympathize with him for his unhappy lot. The word source is uh, used, as you can see. They admit that Jason committed a crime, but it was accidental. At the climax of this tragic moment, Valerius builds a funeral speech delivered by Jason. The speech does not contain praise of the dead, as it is a tradition in funeral speeches, nor it exemplifies the heroic aspect of uh, Sisychus' death. There is no Aristeia for Jason because Sisychus was not a typical villain, therefore his killing was not a good thing. All in all, there is no glory at this word. In uh, this episode, it is difficult to define who is the other, who is the barbarian. Back to Jason's uh, lamentation, the speech is constructed on the feeling of guilt and responsibility for the death of a close friend. Although the physical war is over, Jason continues to wrestle with his feelings of guilt. He understands that it may be the action of the god, a predetermined order that uh, led uh, to this outcome, but still Jason does not overcome the question of guilt. As uh, we can see in passage number two, Jason says that he would be yet that uh, he should be the one who is dead and not uh, Sisychus. 
There is no anger, there is no need for revenge, as it is typical in uh, lamentation uh, speeches. The speech is different, is even darker, as it is full of grief, guilt and anxiety about the future. But how exactly did Valerius build this different uh, speech? What are the scenes that inspired him? Jezina Manuald uh, has very convincingly shown how the structure and motives in Jason's speech are similar to the speech of Aeneas for the palace in Virgil's Aeneid. They are both addressing the dead person as miserante. They both accuse their fortune. They are regretting their direct or indirect involvement, but Aeneas is devastated because of the death of the son of his friend, whereas Jason laments a friend. This crucial difference makes the intertextual similarities even darker in Valerius' case. In Virgil, there is a positive perspective from a heroic death. In Valerius, there is no such heroic perspective following the death of Sisyphus. After Jason's speech, Clite illustrates the personal consequences of Sisyphus' death for her and the country, as she has no children, therefore no successors, which makes her a tragic figure. The speech is reminiscent of Andromache's farewell to Hector and also her reaction to his death in the Iliad, of course. Andromache says that Hector is all she has after she has lost everyone. And uh, so does Clite, as we can see passage number 3. Andromache is worried about uh, her own future and her son's future after Hector's death and she regrets that she didn't hear the last words of her husband and so does Clite. And this is a characteristic element also in Euryalus' mother's speech for her dead son. But Clite is again a more tragic figure. She didn't have children and in addition Euryalus' mother and Andromache lost their loved ones for a heroic purpose. In Clite's case, her husband's death brought nothing heroic or good. At this point, uh, we should make clear that in Apollonius there are no speeches. So what Valerius does by narrating in so detail their lamentation is to make the reader part of this community of mourners. Also, Valerius exploits Virgil and Homer for the construction of this lamentation scene, but he assigns to the borrowed elements more tragic connotations. In this way, he stresses the overwhelmed grief and the people's feelings. It is a grief not only for the past but also for the future. Jupiter's plan to open the seas and to bring the nations in contact has proved to be harmful for individuals and for communities as it is presented more like a military expedition. And the effects are vividly demonstrated in these uh, speeches. All these associations will, with uh, civil war and the impact on the future is an open invitation from Valerius to his readers to associate this scene with the future of the Roman Empire. Unlike Aeneid, uh, Valerius' work does not have many optimistic hints concerning the Roman Empire and its prosperity. The civil war of uh, 68-69 AD seems to have a grave impact on people's future, just like the civil war of Sisyphus. Following this interpretation, we can see that the whole Sisyphus episode is reminiscent also of Lucan's De Bellum Civile. In this epic, the civil war is of course the main theme and uh, the general worldview is the most destructive one. It is a world of, no, of morality, no morality, no heroic virtue, no epic glory. It is a world of uh, madness, uh, we would uh, say. Since so much grief is uh, governing the funeral speeches, is it thus to be considered as a clear look and intertext? And what would that mean for Valerius' worldview? 
In order to explore this theory, I would like to offer a look in parallel, the account of Vulteius' ill-fated voyage. In this episode, a boat carrying a cohort of Caesarian soldiers is trapped by a group of Pompeian men who place chains beneath the water in order to control the vessel and cause it to run aground. The Caesarians are surrounded by Pompey's forces and at first they try to fight. However, they are eventually persuaded by the vessel's captain, Vulteius, to commit collective suicide. Several scholars have seen that the Vulteius episode is a microcosm of uh, the civil war because uh, they turn against their own side. There are some verbal and motive parallels between the two episodes. First of all, the Argonauts and the Caesarians fight not external enemies, but rather turn against uh, their own side. Secondly, the deeds carried out uh, in uh, Vulteius' ship are inspired not by virtues, not by heroism, but rather by furor, madness, as we can see in passage 2b. As we can see also in Jason's speech, after the realization, their, after the realization of their tragic mistake, Jason speculates that it must be furor that led to all this uh, destruction, as we can uh, see in passage 2a. Thirdly, they both committed nephas, crimes. The Argonauts, but also Jason himself, as we see in passage 3a, admit that his acts were impious. Also, in Vulteius' episode, their collective suicide emerges not as a glorious event, but rather as an infamous one, because they engage in totum nephas, as we see in passage 3b. Lastly, both leaders make promises they cannot keep. Jason promises Sisychus that they will fight by their side against the Pelasgians, but it turns out uh, to fight against the people of Sisychus. On the other hand, the men of Vulteius do not become the glorious examples of posterity that Vulteius claims they will be, but instead they are now a pile of corpses. There is no glory from uh, these wars, there is no triumph. So, is Valerius epic and this scene in particular in the same direction as Lucan's epic? The short answer is not so much. The Argonauts, although they have committed crimes against their former hosts, at every opportunity try to remind them of their friendship and show them their empathy. Although everything was very close to the ultimate destruction and madness, this did not come as in Lucan's case. Also, it uh, must be stressed that although in Apollonius' version Clite commits suicide, in Valerius she is alive and she gives a funeral speech where the reader can hear her emotions. Yes, her emotions are the most negative ones, but furor does not madden her to commit suicide. This character, as Valerius has built the scene, had every opportunity to commit suicide. There is fire ready, and like Dido could just jump into the fire. Her husband is dead because of a nephas of the Argonauts, and she has no children, no successors, and yet she does not end her life like Vulteius' men when they committed a nephas. It seems that there is a crack of hope somewhere between all this tragedy. The era of Jupiter is new, but not many elements indicate that it is a better one as well. Although in the first book Valerius presents this new era mostly in optimistic terms, it turns out that the toil and labor will not always bring glory. The Sisychus episode, and especially the funeral speeches, are an illustrating example of this new era with ambiguous consequences. Through the way Valerius has exploited Virgil and Homer, we can see how he underlines the tragic context and result of this expedition. 
as we see it, uh, through multiple perspectives from the people of Sisychus, from the Argonauts, from Jason and uh, Clite, this expedition brings uh, no glory so far. On the other hand, through the way he departs from Lucan, especially concerning the, uh, the absence of uh, the suicide motive, we can see that Valerius does not see the future in terms of total deconstruction, immorality or madness. His view is somewhere in between. After all, the atonement ritual in the end helps the Argonauts to surpass their grief and continue their journey. These funeral speeches can be seen as the first step towards atonement, where the characters reveal their true emotions and try to find relief and uh, consolation. By depicting so vividly their emotional status, Valerius proves to be a learned epicist, who narrates not only actions and battles, but rather expresses the feelings and consequences of every action. In the end, he has very vividly depicted the opposition between darkness and light, ignorance and knowledge, fate and uh, choice, and he has demonstrated that even for the most negative events, there may, there may be a way, even a difficult one, to overcome them. Thank you very much for your attention. Here is my email if you want to contact me. And uh, also I should add that there is uh, the bibliography in the description of the video. Again, thank you very much.